be with you on this very special weekend. Uh, church anniversaries are a wonderful time to look back on what the Lord has done in the lives of the church, but of the individuals also that make up the church. And this morning we rejoice in what the Lord has done for the body these many years, but maybe as well through the day, you can think back to the day when you came to Christ. And that's the reason you're here and why you are part of this body and why you are rejoicing in this day. Because the church is made up of nothing but individuals. And this morning you can remember back in my life, it was back in 1965. Maybe you can remember back when you came to Christ and you can rejoice in that this morning as well as in the birth of this church and the many years of growth that the Lord has given to it. It is a great delight for Debbie and I to be here today. We always enjoy coming down to Adelaide and we always go back refreshed. Even if we've been worked a little bit, we go back uh, greatly refreshed. And I feel encouraged this morning and been able to refocus and gain revision again for the work of the Lord. And we uh, are just blessed to be here. And thank you for that wonderful opportunity. In light of that, I would like to ask you and invite you to take your Bibles this morning and turn back to the passage that we read for our scripture reading. And that is in the book of Acts and chapter 2. The book of Acts and chapter 2. And as already been indicated, I want to speak on the subject this morning of the non-negotiables for building strong churches. And we're primarily going to stay right here in Acts 2, though I'll refer to some other references and we'll turn there. Some we'll turn to, some I'll just mention but we'll reference some other passages to help us this morning, the non-negotiables for building strong churches. In just a moment, we'll read two more of the verses that we've already read for our scripture reading. But before we do, let's pray and commit our time of study to the Lord. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you this morning for the day when Christ became our own personal Savior. Even now, we remember the time when someone took the scriptures and shared them with me, with us, or we read your word or a gospel tract, and the Holy Spirit worked in our heart and enlightened our mind and showed us our need of your Son. We thank you for that. And we thank you that now, Lord, from all parts of the country, we've been able to gather for this special occasion and this special day. And we ask, Lord, that it would be an encouraging time. But Father's well, only a stepping stone to the future. And if your son would tarry in coming, that, uh, Lord, you would continue to give many wonderful years of ministry and blessing to uh, Hope Church. But we commit ourselves to you now, Lord, for the study of your word. We've opened it. We know that it has a living message for us, and we pray that you would guide us today in our consideration of it, and that this morning we would grasp the message that you have, the one that you desire to give to us, and that it might further us as a church, as a body, but it would further us individually. So bless our time, and we pray this in your son's name. Amen. For our scripture reading today, we began with verse 37, with the conclusion of the sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, and the response to that sermon, and then we read all the way down to verse 47. But the linking two verses between the people's response to Peter's preaching and the call to trust Christ, and the resulting daily life and the life of those people is found in verses 41 and 42. That's the, the hinge, the leaking point. 
And verse 41 says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto, the, unto them about 3,000 souls. Now look what those 3,000 people did. 3,000. Here's what they did. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now the verses that we have just read mark the beginning of what verse 47 refers to as the church. This is only the third time that that term church is used in the New Testament. The first occasion you remember was in Matthew chapter 16 when the Lord gave a prophetic word and said that upon this rock he would build his church. The second reference with that term in mind is in Matthew 18 in the relationship to church discipline. And now it's here in Acts 2 in this third use of the term that we find the fulfillment of the Lord's prediction in Matthew 16. Here is the beginning of the New Testament church Christ said he would build. Now this morning it's not my intent to draw our attention to the church's beginning and the Lord's building of it. However, it is my intent on this special day in the life of your church to turn our focus to what the church did when it gathered in order to continue its spiritual growth. Coming to Christ as our Savior only makes us an infant, so to speak. And yet you know as well as I do that the New Testament contains numerous things that will encourage us in our spiritual growth. If we could take and sum up many of them, and they're not all listed here in verse 42, but if we could take and sum up many of them, we would find that this is what the first church, the early church, engaged itself in when it gathered and in order to build its spiritual health. Verse 42 indicates that the early church occupied itself with four primary activities when it gathered together for worship as we're doing this morning. This verse tells us they continued in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking bread and in prayers. Now from other passages in the New Testament, we know that they no doubt engaged in other spiritual activities as well, such as the singing of hymns or church business meetings, Acts 13, or the public reading of the word. There were other spiritual activities, um, but here in Acts 2, scripture reveals that the early church primarily gathered, or at least at the top of the list, they gathered for worship by engaging in these four spiritual disciplines. In other words, what determined, uh, what they did was not determined by uh, an historical church council or conference. What they did was not determined by the personal preferences of church leadership or by the desires of those who met for worship. Neither was it determined by history, by the culture in which they lived, what they felt would draw a crowd on Sunday mornings. What the early church engaged in was determined by the leadership of its head, Jesus Christ, the one who began the church in the first place. And so when the early church gathered, these are the four activities that were primary in their worship and in their meetings. And when our church up in North Queensland gathers, or your church here in Adelaide gathers, these are the divinely ordained activities for us to occupy ourselves with and which we are to adhere ourselves with. 
And I've chosen those two terms, occupy ourselves and adhere ourselves. I've chosen occupy and adhere by design because of how the verse begins. In verse 42, it says they continued steadfastly. Now, that's actually one word in the original text, and it's a word that means that. They occupied themselves with or they adhered themselves to. These were the things that they adhered to and devoted themselves to. These were the things that were central to their worship and gatherings. Other things, singing, church business meetings, sending out missionaries, the public reading of the word. These are all found in the New Testament as well. But these are the things that were central to their worship and their gatherings. And subsequently, and if our intent is to be scriptural in our services, these are the elements that make up the content of our gatherings as well. And the things on a very foundational level, those other things as well, but on a very foundational level, these are the four things that we begin with to build a strong, stable, vibrant church. So first of all, they adhered themselves to what is referred to as the apostles' doctrine or the word doctrine, the apostles' instruction. First and foremost, and I don't think it's by accident that of the four, this one is placed first. First and foremost, the early church gathered to hear the instruction or the teaching of the apostles. Or I could put it this way, the early church gathered to hear the instructions which the apostles gave through the public preaching of the word. Now, without going into great detail or scriptural proof this morning, preaching is central to the church and its gatherings. This is the core of the church life. While other aspects of ministry may come and go, Preaching cannot. A church would not be a New Testament church without preaching. We might be religious in nature. We might be a social group, but we would not be a New Testament church. And I could give numerous references on that this morning, but I just point two out for our attention. One is found in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. I'll read it for us. If you have time, you can turn. If not, you can just listen at this point. But in Titus chapter 1, verse 2, it says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Verse 3, But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching. Even from eternity past, it was God's intent to manifest his word, I have his word, you have his word in your hands today. It was God's intent to manifest his word through, through preaching. Primarily the public ministry of the word. It would also include the private instruction of the word in Bible studies or even in private counsel. But primarily we're thinking of 3,000 people this morning who adhered to the public preaching of God's word by the apostles. Preaching is central to a church's ministry. Now in my Bible, I'm in Titus chapter 1, and if I turn back one page to 2 Timothy chapter 4, I find another reference on this. 2 Timothy 4 verse 1 Paul writes to Timothy, the young pastor, and he says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. And he actually goes on down to verse five and talks about the necessity of preaching the word. But notice the necessity of the word in the fourth verse in my the fourth word in my verse, I charge thee therefore, 
And the therefore refers Timothy back to everything Paul said in chapter 3. Primarily, what's given in verses 1 to 5, that the closer we come to Christ's return, the more perilous the times will come. And the only thing that will pull men and women out of the muck and the mire of the sin and the characteristics of perilous times is the ministry of the word. The word of God is our life blood. And so here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it was by design that the apostles preached and the 3,000 people listened. They weren't trying to fill up an hour on the clock. By design, they wanted the ministry of the word. And I like what some people said one time to try to define what Timothy was to preach, preach the word. You know what the word is? As someone said, and it always stuck with me, the word of God is nothing but those black things on that white page. Preaching the word is not someone standing here giving an oration on their own philosophy and their own thoughts. The word is, is those black things on that white page. And that leads then to the second thing that I want to point out about the, their adhering to the word. And then we'll make a little application before we go on to the second point. But the early church gathered to hear the apostles' instruction. In other words, there's preaching like I'm doing this morning, but what is to be the content of that preaching? They gathered to hear the apostles' instruction, but what do you mean the apostles' instruction? What, what's the content of that instruction? What is that like? What was that content? Well, we don't have to wonder about that. Because in the book of Acts, there are numerous instances of the apostles preaching. In fact, in the book of Acts, there are some 10 occasions of the preaching of Paul alone. And if you study those examples, you will note several characteristics. They just keep showing up. So we know they're the things that characterize the preaching, <coughs> excuse me, of these men. Let me give you two of those characteristics this morning, just two of them, and there are others. But in the first place, and follow me now, don't just take this for granted, the preaching of the apostles was scriptural. It was scriptural preaching. And even if you take your Bibles, I mean, we're in Acts 2, okay? Well, I'm in 2 Timothy 4. <laughs> so you can see that I'm turning back to Acts chapter 2, where our text is this morning. And if we just stay within that chapter and go back to that preaching of Peter by way of illustration that their preaching was scriptural, you will note in Peter's first sermon here in Acts that his preaching was scriptural. For instance, in Acts chapter 2, verse 14, Peter stands up with the 11 and he begins to speak. But just immediately in verse 16, it says, but this is, you know, Peter's preaching. You have to imagine that Peter's saying this. But this is that which you which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he quotes from the book of Joel. If you go down to verse number 25, Acts 2, 25, Peter continues preaching and he says, for David speaketh concerning him. And he quotes from Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11. Then if you go down to verse number 30, he says, therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to the, 
sit on his throne. At that point, he's quoting from Psalm 132. In verse 31, he seen this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. He's quoting from Psalm 16. If you go down to verse number 34, he says, For David has not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself. And now he quotes from Psalm 110. If you just take Peter's first sermon, I mean, here are five Old Testament quotations that Peter is using as the basis for his sermon. You see what I'm saying? Now, of course, they didn't have the New Testament. They're the New Testament in the making. They just had the Old Testament, but you can see what I'm saying that scattered throughout, Peter didn't just read a scripture and then he took off on his own. Peter kept in the preaching going back to the Old Testament and then he would explain that. Then he would talk more about a reference in the Old Testament and he'd explain that. Then he would give another reference from the Old Testament and he would explain that and another reference and he would explain that. And finally at the end, he says, now what are you going to do with the word of God? His preaching was scriptural. The apostles made use of the Old Testament. And when these men preached, they were doing what Paul told Timothy to do. Preach the word. That's what these men were doing. And as someone has said, I mentioned the word of God is nothing but the black letters on that white page. And that's what Peter was doing. He kept going back. And the apostles preached those words by explaining those words, illustrating those words, applying those words, and then exhorting people as if to say, come on, let's all do what the word says now. This is preaching which is scriptural. A second characteristic that builds on that is the fact that the apostles' teaching was, here's a bigger word, the apostles' preaching was expositional in nature. That's a big word, isn't it, expositional? You probably haven't used that in your daily conversation this past week. It was expositional. By that, I mean expositional. It was sustained explanation of a Bible passage or topic. Sustained explanation. It wasn't just a bunch of miscellaneous Bible verses that were read or talked about during a given amount of time. It wasn't just the recounting of an Old Testament story or an event. It wasn't just a man coming up with things to say about a particular verse or scripture. The apostles' teaching and preaching was the sustained over time, and it takes time. This wasn't a 15-minute devotional. Over time, sustained explanation of a Bible passage or topic. And you might hear people then from expositional refer to the fact that their preaching is expository. Now, many misunderstand that and think that's just kind of reading through and commenting as they go along. But really, expository preaching and expositional preaching is the sustained explanation of a Bible passage or a topic. Now, how do we know that this was the nature of the preaching in Acts, especially when you look at that preaching and it doesn't appear to be sustained explanation. It appears to be mainly topical. Which, side note, does read, lead me to a third characteristic, was that their preaching was Christological in nature. Christ was the center of it. But if you look in the book of Acts, it doesn't appear that their preaching was, you know, explanation sustained explanation. I mean, you can see that that's what Peter's doing in Acts 2, but sustained explanation. How do we know that? Where am I getting that from? Well, and we won't take the time to go there because you're familiar with these 
illustrations from the book of Acts. But if you consider two things, you'll understand that their preaching was expositional, sustained explanation of the Old Testament. Consider, for instance, the lengthy instruction that Paul gave when he preached. In the book of Acts chapter 11, verses 22 to 26, the church in Jerusalem hears that the church in Antioch, or the people, I shouldn't say the church, it wasn't a church yet in Antioch, but people in Antioch had come to trust Christ as their Savior. So they sent, who did they send? Do you remember who the church in Jerusalem sent to find out what was going on up in Antioch? They sent Barnabas, didn't they? And when Barnabas got there, Barnabas thought, hey, this is too big a job for me. I'm going to go get Saul of Tarsus, later Paul. I'm going to go get Saul of Tarsus and bring him up here to help me. And Saul went to Antioch with Barnabas. And the Bible says they stayed one whole year teaching those people the scriptures. And if you go over to Acts chapter 19, verses 9 to 10, Paul went to Ephesus and there was a lot of disputing. So Paul went to the school of Tyrannius. How long did he stay in the school of Tyrannius? Do you remember how long was it? It was two years explaining the scriptures. What was Paul doing all this time? Folks, Paul wasn't just preaching salvation messages for two years. The Bible says he was arguing and disputing, not like we would argue, <laughs> okay? Um, more um, ex explanation. He was arguing and disputing for two years about the truths of Scripture. And not just salvation. And folks, we know <clears throat> we, we not only have the apostle sermons in the book of Acts that give us this, in, I, this point, but we have over 21 letters in the New Testament, which the apostles wrote. And those letters are sustained explanation and argumentation of the core truths of the Christian faith. Romans, the whole book of Romans, is nothing but an entire discourse on justification by faith. Ephesians is a whole discourse on God's purpose for the church. 1 Thessalonians is a whole discourse on the coming of Christ. So apostolic instruction and preaching was sustained explanation of truth, either by explaining one passage of Scripture or by weaving passages of Scripture together that dealt with a particular topic. And as I say, there are other characteristics of apostolic preaching but this is what the early church adhered to. Now, we wouldn't get 3,000 people in here this morning. But when 3,000 people got together, the apostles publicly and privately gave sustained explanation of Old Testament text. And the personal nature, someone says this morning, that's all very interesting. But folks, the personal nature of that is seen when I read the title of a book. This book. The apostles were doing expository preaching, like Peter would stand here and do expository preaching to sustain the Old Testament. Do you know what the 3,000 people out there were doing? Expository listening. There's a way that you listen to that kind of preaching so you grow. That's the reason, folks, it says, the second word in verse 42 says, and they, they is a plural word. And while the apostles stood and preached expositionally and scripture, the 3,000 people were out there in the congregation and they were listening expositorily. They were listening. Their listening matched up with the preaching because, folks, preaching is nothing but a two-way street. If you weren't here this morning, I could stand here and deliver this address, and that's what it would be. It would be an address or a discourse or a lecture. It wouldn't be preaching. For me to stand here and preach, there has to be people. There has to be a congregation. That's New Testament. 
And there's a way to listen to that. And the reason I mention that, folks, is because that's what was going on here. A man stood and preached, but it wasn't just that the people were out there kind of sitting there being entertained. They were listening. And what I like about this little book is that the author goes through various means and ways that people should listen so that their listening matches up with the preaching. And that's how you're going to build a strong Jerusalem church in the first century that is fraught by persecution. These people are going to go out in the week and they're going to be persecuted. I mean, the way is not a popular belief in the first century. But these people are not only going to be able to stand up in the midst of that, but they personally, internally are going to grow to be like Christ because they have adhered. Hey, that's a good word. I didn't have that in my notes. Expository listening, they adhered. Maybe that's not a good way to use that word. I don't know, but it's it's good. It just came to my mind. They adhered. They listened in a certain way. And so preaching is a two-way street. A second element, and we won't take as long on this one. The preaching was the core one, I think, but... A second element that was involved when the early church gathered is fellowship. Now, this is going to build on preaching. Follow me here. What is, folks, what is fellowship? I heard a preacher ask that one question, that time, asked the congregation one time that I was sitting in, and he said, fellowship is not two fellows in a ship. But a lot of people think that's what it is. In other words, you've got two guys, and they've got something in common. The ship. Well, there is a truth to that because <coughs> this term fellowship does mean to share or to have something in common with someone. And it's when it's used of people, it's talking about something they have in common or that they have a mutual interest in. For instance, this term is used in, in verse 44. Okay, if you see verse 44, it says, and all that believed were together and I had all things common. That's the same word. And it's referring to the fact there in verse 44 that they had their possessions in common. This word is used, for instance, in Luke chapter 5, verse 10, when it says that James and John were partners in a fishing business. It's, that's the same Greek term. They had an occupation in common. They shared an occupation in this case. So when people have something in common, it is said to be fellowship. Now, in this sense, you have to follow me, in this sense, there is a certain kind of fellowship that even lost people have when they share something in common, like fishing, or stamp collecting, or refinishing antique furniture. I mean, they do have something in common. Or even when family members belong to the same church and they have common ground, they help build the facilities, or they support one of their brother's children who's gone out from the church as a missionary. There's something in common. But what I'm interested in is what type of fellowship did the people in Acts 2.42 have? What did these early believers have in common? At this point, two things. Number one, and I'll tell you what it is and then I'll explain it. Number one, there was a common salvation in Christ. Now, in Acts 2.5, we find these people were all devout Jews. They were pious Jews that had the Old Testament in common. But in Acts 2.42, something has happened by that time that brought them 
into fellowship together. Between Acts 2.5 and Acts 2.42 was what? Peter's sermon, which ended, ye stiff-necked in heart, repent and believe the gospel, which is what they did. And at that point, 3,000 people became a church, a new body, and adhered themselves to something they have in common. Back here, they were just Jews, devout Jews, the Old Testament. But now, by 242, they've got Christ. And they responded to the ministry of the word. That's one thing they had in common. But a second thing that they have in common is that these people adhered themselves. You're right. I'm going to go back to it. <laughs> they adhered themselves to the apostles' instruction. This common attention to the apostles' teaching became common ground between them. These early believers individually had accepted Christ as their Savior and Messiah, and then they also, they had that in common, but they also personally accepted and responded to the instruction from the Old Testament, which the apostles gave through preaching. In other words, they accepted that doctrinal instruction, and they ordered their lives by that. The point being that common theological positions and common convictions and practices based on it bring a deeper fellowship than just being Christians together. There is a type of fellowship between two Christians when they get in a ship and go, fell and, and go fishing together. There is a common fellowship when two Christians get together over a cup of tea, talk about the garden they've planted or how the flowers are blooming or how the children are doing in school. They can have a certain fellowship just over that common thing, but it's not very deep spiritually. New Testament fellowship, Acts 2.42 fellowship, is really talking about spiritual things like what was learned or adopted when God's word was preached publicly on the Lord's Day. And believers get together and they sit down and talk about that. If I can put this word of commendation, and I trust I won't embarrass anyone but if I can say it's one of the joys that I have of coming to Hope Church. And I've been here on several occasions for Easter camp and National Youth Camp. And um, it puts a preacher under a little bit of pressure when he knows he's going to preach. And then afterwards, the young people are going to get together because they've asked him to send study questions down ahead of time. It puts a preacher under a little pressure to know he's going to preach, and then they're going to sit down for another hour like that camp out of that big building that time. I remember that. And they sat down for another hour, and they discussed what was preached. That's what this is talking about, fellowship. And during the week, emailing each other or commenting or getting together for a cup of tea after work and saying, you know, what you what you think about that on Sunday? You know, I... I kind of struggled with that. What you and they say, well, I, this, I think this is, you know, I think you're right. That is what was being said, and and uh, I, you know, you know, I actually tried that today. I was with a coworker, and they were doing something, and I said to them, and I said what the pastor said, and they said, oh, you know, I never thought about that. And you're fellowshipping together. Now, that doesn't mean you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. And it doesn't mean you talk, don't talk about stamp collecting or growing flowers or, you know, um, shearing your poodles, you know, and what your poodle looks like after you, you know. To, but you talk about those things. But you're real. There's really deep intimacy. When the believers are conversing about those spiritual things that they learned 
and they talked about. And so we gather as Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 says, but remember what it says, you provoke one another to love and good works. It's the only time when a Christian can be a stir. Use that term down here in Adelaide up in North Queens when people talk about a stir. You know, they're always meddling in other people's business. They're always stirring the pot, you know, and they've always got something cooking about somebody else, you know. This is the only time when you can be a good stir, provoking one another to love and good works. And you do that primarily on a foundational level as you fell, <coughs> excuse me, fellowship around the things of the Lord. A third element back in Acts 2.42, and I'm back in Acts 2.42 now, a third element that the early church engaged in when they gathered for worship in order to build a strong church is what's called breaking a bread. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread. Now, what is in view here is not the activity of having meals together. They, they were doing that. If you read down, down in the passage, for instance, in verse number 46, and they continued daily with one accord and breaking fellowship from house to house. They were fellowshipping together. There was hospitality going on and they would get together for meals. And that is a good thing for Christians to be able to visit together in that sense, but that's not what's being referred to in verse 42 because, and someone says, how do you know that? Because literally my, my English text says in breaking a bread, if I read that origin from the original, it would read in the breaking of the bread. And there's the definite article T H E in there, the breaking of the bread. And what that means is that they're referring to a unique breaking of bread, not just a daily doing meals together, but a the, the means definite, a definite article, the breaking of the bread. There was a definite time involved, a definite event when bread was broken, that they're referring to. And from the rest of Acts and the activity of the early church in Acts, we know that that was the observing of what we would refer to as the Lord's table or communion is what they were involved here. Now, why was that one of the distinctive elements when the early church gathered? Why was, the, why, why was communion of the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, why was that one of the key activities, one of the core activities, the core spiritual disciplines of the church? Well, I'll mention three things very quickly that might help with that. Number one, in the first place, Christ established this as a practice his followers were to observe until he comes again. 1 Corinthians 11, 33 to 32. So the early church was following the instructions of Christ and continuing to practice what he began. But folks, this practice was also observed by the early church because of its significance. And there are actually about four or five things here. I'm not going to only mention three, but they adhered to this because of its significance. If I asked you this morning to take out a half sheet of paper, I say that because when I was in Bible college, I had a professor. It was also, it was always tear to our heart when he started class, let's pray. And he got done and he said, amen. And then he said, okay, take out a half sheet of paper because now it was quiz time. <laughs> and he would ask you like five questions. And, you know, if he asked you 50, that's a lot of questions. But if you didn't know a few, you could kind of, you know, act like you didn't get along. But on five questions, this is make or break. So if I asked you this morning, um, take out a half sheet of paper and list three significant points about the Lord's table, uh, what would you write down? <laughs> 
Well, the scripture actually gives us several significant points about the Lord's table, and no doubt <coughs> this is why the early church adhered to it. For instance, this is a means observing the Lord's table communion. This is a means of believers remembering what Christ did on the cross, right? I mean, that's obvious. And now that I mentioned, you probably would have written that down. Luke twenty two nineteen, 19, the Lord said this do in remembrance of me. And often when someone is departing this life, they will leave something tangible behind for people to remember them by. It might be a photograph that they had taken three months. They knew they, you know, it was terminal. So they went and had a photograph taken and it, they leave that behind. Or maybe they give someone a special um, a, a brooch or a necklace or something that was personal to them. Maybe they pass on the family Bible. Maybe there's a statue that's made of them. The Lord didn't leave anything tangible like that behind. What he left behind to remember his passing was a meal. This observance of the Lord's table. And in particular, he left that because of what the elements symbolize, the broken body and the shed blood. So that made it significant. They, I mean, here were these early church believers and the Lord had gone to heaven. And now through the observance of this, they could remember his death. Some of these people were probably there at the cross. Maybe at the time they didn't realize what was happening. But now after Peter preached, 3,000 got saved. Some of those people might have been there at Jerusalem, some of those 3,000. And now, oh, now I see the significance. Boy, I just, I just was really so naive. I was there at the cross. I saw this. I didn't realize. And they're remembering what the Lord did. It is a significance. It is a public proclamation of his death, isn't it? Um, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26 says that you do show, or the word means you preach the Lord's death till he come. That word is used in Acts 13, 5 when Saul and Barnabas preached the word. It's used in Acts 17, 3 when Paul preached to Christ to the Thessalonians. The same word, when you observe the Lord's table, it's a public preaching of the word about Christ's death. And in the first century, filled with the persecution of Christians, that proclamation, folks, was an individual identifying with the death of Christ and publicly preaching that. I mean, all 3,000 people weren't standing behind the pulpit declaring that, but when they participated in the Lord's table, they were each individually proclaiming to a lost world around them they publicly were showing and preaching, I've identified with Christ's death. And they were sharing in the death, burial, and resurrection. And it was a statement of fellowship between the believers, wasn't it? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 15 to 17 refers to this. It uses the word communion there, the same word for fellowship. And these people, a significant point was when they participated together, it was a united fellowship. When they partook of the elements, they were saying they were united in their hearts with one another. Which means this, folks, a little bit of a ex, you know, expansion on that. Because of this significance surrounding this practice and observing it, the Lord's table, forks, folks, is designed to keep us right with God and with one another. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 30, verse 30 says, remember what it says? That you're not to eat or drink unworthily. And so every time you come to observe the Lord's table, you've got to make sure you're right with God. And you've got to make sure you're right with every other member in the congregation. You can't eat or drink this is a symbol that we are united in our common belief in Christ. But if I'm observing it here, but there's a brother back there 
and I'm I'm not united to him. I mean, he's a brother. I'm a brother. We're both, but I'm not. We've had a bit of a tiff. We've had a falling out. We've burned some bridges. I mean, you know, we give the hello, but we really don't fellowship together because there's been an offense. The Lord's table. Here's a significant point. It's designed to make Christians get right with one another because you can't participate if you're not. Now, I just went over those significant points very quickly. You might not have been able to keep all of them in your mind, and there's several others. The point is, someone says, why did they participate in the Lord? I mean, why was that? A co- because of the significance around it. What they were declaring, what they were believing, the fact that they had them on it. However, however often you observe the Lord's table, let's say once a month, in Cardwell, we observe once a month, first Sunday of the month, at least once a month, I got to get right with God. And at least once a month, I've got to make sure I'm right with every other member in the congregation. So 12 times a year. Now, hopefully, I mean, I'm just putting it in that, in that chronological s- s- sequence, but I mean, hopefully at all times we're right with God and everyone else every day. But at least 12 times a year, we are called to give an account before God. So you could see why the early church made this a core issue. The proclamation of Christ's death, the belief in it, identification with it, keeping the 3,000 people in harmony with one another. And then, of course, there's this fourth element, the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. The early church gathered to pray. And that indicates at least three things to us. Number one, prayer was a non-negotiable part of the church ministry. The church regularly prayed together. Now, I've got some references here. We're not going to take the time to look at them in Acts, but Acts 4, Acts 6, Acts 12, Acts 13, Acts 21. You would know many of these. And you can go through the book of Acts on your own and know the numerous times that the early church prayed together. This was an indispensable, prayer was an indispensable part of the church's ministry. They had times when the church praised God in prayer, times when they sought a knowledge of God's will through prayer, when they requested intervention in the affairs of the church and the life of the church. It was when the church was praying that the Holy Spirit said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work I've called them to do. I mean, we could go through all of that and explain all of those little things, but you're familiar with much of that. I'll leave that with you. But that's one indication as to why they prayed. Prayer, or what prayer was, church, or prayer was a regular part of their ministry. A second thing, Acts 2.42, indicates that the church, why the church not only prayed and were involved in that, but they, it indicates, folks, they had specific times set aside just for that purpose. Someone says, how do you know that? Because of that definite article again, you know, T-H-E. The original would read, they continued in the breaking of, of the bread and in the prayers. There's actually a definite article in the original before the word prayers. They continued in the prayers, definite prayers. They had specific times when the church would gather for the specific purpose of praying. Not simply that they opened and closed their services in prayer, but there were specific times set aside for the church to be able to gather with the intent of praying. And a third thing about prayer in Acts 2.42 is why the church continued in this practice. Simply put, the nature of church ministry is spiritual work And only God can do that. So you need to pray to get God's help to do the church work. Like this morning before the service, when several of us gathered in Pastor Key's study and committed the service to prayer. Now you could do the same thing before you come and before you leave your house on Sunday morning. To come to church. Your family could just take even just five minutes 
Everybody's dressed, ready to go, out the door, and uh, sit on the lounge for a moment. Let's commit the service to God in prayer. Because it's a spiritual work. The youth ministry, YAF, um, the seniors ministry, when the ladies gather for a Bible study once a month, the, the ministries of the church, um, we all understand that we need God to do the work. And it's through prayer that we engage the Lord and seek his blessing. We won't take the time to turn there, but Acts chapter 4, verses 23 to 33 give indication of this. The apostles were called before the religious leaders to give account. And, uh, you know, they're, they have to obey God rather than men. They, you know, were released. They went back to the group and they prayed. And the Bible says when they prayed, place was shaken and they were given boldness and courage to go out and minister the word. So prayer was an essential activity when the early church gathered for worship. So when the church gathers for worship, one reason for to build strength and spiritual life in the church, when the church gathers, what are the essential elements? Well, there must be the public preaching of the apostles' doctrine. And I'm talking about for worship. That doesn't mean if the church gathers for a church picnic down at the park, okay, that, you know, you've got to have an hour and a half sermon or something, you know. But when the church gathers for worship, um, there's the public preaching of the apostles' doctrine. The public preaching of Scripture through the sustained explanation of biblical passages and subjects. There must be the fellowship of the saints. Verbal interaction between the saints regarding the Bible, regarding the common theological truths of Scripture, and the daily practicing of those truths. There must be the breaking of the bread, the regular observance of the Lord's table in order to remember and preach his death and in order to challenge our unity and our love for one another. And there must be times of prayer, times when God's people bring their wills in line with his will. And when they engage the Lord in accomplishing his work through the body. These are the things that the early church adhered to in order to build a strong body. They're, they're, they're an infant church. I mean, they just got saved. Peter preached and 3,000 of them responded. They're an infant church. They've got to be built up in the faith. And so right from the start, here are the things that they engaged in to help do that. Here are the essentials when we gather for worship. And sometimes someone may come to a worship service and they've been coming for such a long time and they say, why do we always do the same thing? Why, why don't we do something different? Well, there are times when you do something different. You have a musical item or something. But why? You know, every, it's, it's the order of service is pretty much the same. It's just, you know, because this is what the early church engaged in, what the head of the body gave for them to do in order to build themselves up in the faith. So what we do in our service is not something that is open for discussion or we vote on it. How many want to have singing in the services from now on? All in favor, yeah, and all in favor, no. It's not something we decide on. The head, our head, Jesus Christ, our Savior, is the one who predicted he would build his church, and now here he is, and he's beginning that prediction of building. How does, he, how does the head do that? He leads the people. Here's what to do to build the church. To edify and to strengthen it. But folks, more than spiritual endeavors for the church, these are the four things, the individuals in a church, and others as well, singing different things, giving of our gifts and tithes, but... More than spiritual endeavors, these are the things the individuals in a church should adhere to 
personally. A church is made up of people and a church is no stronger or greater than the individual people who make it up. And if we want to have a strong assembly, if we want to have a strong body, then the individual the individual members, the wrists and the elbows and the shoulders and the fingers and the lungs and you know, the body's made up of of members, my ears and nose and and, and my if if you know, if my thumb is disjointed or I'm playing basketball and the basketball hits my finger and bends my finger and sprains it in and the great pain. And for three or four days, I'm just in agony. My whole body suffers. If I want a strong body, all of my members have to be strong and working. I mean, it only takes a little toothache and the whole body. I don't even feel like going to work for the day. I don't even feel like getting out of bed, really. It takes... All the members have to be strong for the body to be invigorated and really be able to get out there and do the work that God wants us to do. So these aren't just things for the church to do. These are things for us as individuals to do. Faithful to church in the public ministry of the word. Deliberately fellowshipping with other believers about spiritual matters. Observing and participating in the Lord's table in a reverential way. And engaging ourselves in prayer with the other believers in the church. These are the spiritual habits we engage ourselves in month after month and year after year. (laughs) And as we do, may we personally grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And may our churches be nurtured in the faith so that what Paul wrote to so many of them in his epistles would actually be true with us. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we gather this morning, we thank you for the opportunity of spending some time looking into your word. Thank you, Lord, for the instruction that we've been given. And Lord, the direction for our individual lives and for our church. And the things we can engage in to build ourselves up. Lord, minister your word to our heart individually today and apply it distinctly and uniquely to each one of us, as you know we need. And we ask, Lord, that the result will be that in the years ahead, that this church would be vibrant and strong and would grow. And the Lord, the result would be that our impact in this community would be vibrant and strong. And most of all, through all of this, Lord, that we might lift up your son that he can draw men to himself. And we pray this today in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.